It's time for ROTD Weekend. So I know that I had been telling you that I was going to be on live TV and uh, I was kind of in that weird time warp about it. And it literally just happened as I record now. By the time you listen to it, it will have happened a little while ago. But I thought I'm having all this energy and excitement. It went really well. And I wanted to just jump on and tell you that and record the intro to this weekend's podcast while doing that. So yeah, it was really great. It was on Fox 35 Orlando, and I will put the link to the clip in the show notes. You can definitely go watch it. There were three hosts on set with me. They were lovely, fun, really kind, really welcoming. I felt very comfortable to be there. The production team also just really welcoming and nice people. I was, yeah, relaxed and had a good time. I was making barbecue sauce, and I was talking about cooking burnout and how to separate out the chore of cooking from the joy and love of cooking. And and so the barbecue sauce is like a really fun way to play around with some new spices. So yeah, that's what we're doing. It went really, really well. And I'm very happy. I am also very happy to tell you about my guest on the show for today. I'm talking with Eric Leadhome of Wildwood Spirits. He, of course, has a wonderful recipe for me that may or may not involve some spirits. And I think you're going to really love this conversation. We kind of get a little bit sciencey about the making of of alcohols and it was it was really really delightful to talk with Eric. I think you are going to love this conversation. So, let's listen now to my conversation with Eric Leadholm. Hi Eric, welcome to the show. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to talk with you because I've read that you got started in making spirits through making grappa first. How did th- I don't I don't even know if I know for sure what grappa is and like how did you get to there? Well, let's start with what grappa is. Grappa is kind of the hot dog of the spirit world. It's made with all the leftovers of the winemaking oh. process. And so depending on what type of leftovers you get, whether it's white or red, determines whether or not you need to ferment it. And if you get red pumice, you don't need to ferment it. You can go right ahead and distill it and turn it into an interesting brandy. Or if you get uh, white pumice, then you need to ferment it. And it's very tricky to ferment something that has very little sugar or moisture. But you do that, and we I did it. And over the many years that I was making it from this little pot still that I bought in Portugal, kind of got a little better at it. And I became kind of a hobbyist into an enthusiast. And then my business partner got wind that I was doing this type of thing. And at the time, the legislation in, in Washington State changed and allowed restaurant blokes like John Howie and I to make wine and spirits. And so he started planting the seed of an idea to do a much larger project than one that I had intended to do with a friend of mine. And so the little seed started to grow, uh, but I'm I'm an enthusiast. I'm not an, an expert per se, other than just being in the restaurant business for a gazillion years. So we needed to work on, or I, need, I felt I needed to work on some validation before we're going around asking people for a bunch of money. So I got a business degree at Michigan State University. I am not a chemist by any stretch of the imagination, which in essence is what a distiller is. So I went back to school. I went to the Institute of Brewing and Distilling in London and got my master's in distilling. So I had at least some credibility going up to someone and say, hey, I'm really enthusiastic about spirits. Can I have a million dollars? So we had a little bit more traction when we're we're trying to do a, a larger project and asking folks for some money. So I started to learn all I could about spirits and distilling and the grappa idea turned into something much larger. And we kind of developed this idea of Wildwood Spirits Company that it would be this chef and sommelier driven business because John Howie is a chef and I'm a wine guy, a sommelier. And we decided to kind of use that ethos in creating our spirits. But what was important to me about the project was that it had a lot of nostalgia Mm -hmm. and hence Wildwood Spirits Company. Wildwood is the street I grew up on in East Lansing, Michigan. Oh, how nice. Kind of starts with that and we, we go from there. So why, so I I had not realized that that was the name of your street. I thought it had maybe something to do with where the ingredients are coming from. Are you growing ingredients? Where do they come from for your distilling? 
Well, yeah, we, we, we kind of follow this ethos of, of being a chef and sommelier driven business. Uh, so we wanted to use ingredients that were seasonal. But at the same time, it's a distillery. And in a restaurant, you can get away with shifting with the seasons. With the distillery, we wanted to have a, a consistently good product. Mm. So one of the things that I learned when we were developing our spirits at Michigan State University was that we could do something particularly with our gin called fractional distillation. And so mm. in our gin cure, uh, we use seven different botanicals. And each one of those botanicals we distill separately. So when a particular ingredient is in season, we distill that. We take what's called a fraction and hold it in a, an oxygen-free attenuation tank. And so once we have all our botanicals distilled, then we blend it like a chef would with a recipe. Oh. Uh, so we highlight the seasonality of an ingredient, and then also we can maintain consistency from batch to batch. And so when people n normally make gin or when they're not using the fractional distillation, would they be distilling everything at the same time? So then you're just... Yeah, yeah, called a one pot method where you mm -hmm. put the juniper, your coriander, all of the ingredients in and then make your distillation run. Uh, so I guess we're kind of masochistic when it comes to making our gin. But what we what we learned at Michigan State in working with all of these because the, the program at Michigan State is a, a graduate program and all of these folks are working on their PhDs and dissertations and each one doing a different discipline of distillation. And so one person was doing their dissertation on gin botanicals. So I worked with this person for a couple of weeks to create our profile, our flavor profile. And what was, again, important to us was that it was logical. We didn't have a hodgepodge of ingredients. We selected the ingredients because they taste good together. So culinarily, like you could make a salad out of our ingredients, like Ooh. using those flavors, and it wouldn't taste weird. So it wasn't using botanicals for the sake of botanicals. But I'm... Uh, a Negroni guy. I love oh, Negronis. I love and Negronis. Have, yeah. Yeah. And you know, why not try to make your Negroni better? And so we did that with our gin. Uh, we wanted a big punch of orange. And we learned through this guy working on his dissertation on gin botanicals was that the highest level of orange flavor comes from the Seville orange mm. has the highest level of what's called limelin. And we said, well, great, let's use Seville oranges. And we were all excited about it. And that's when we learned, well, Seville oranges are only available two months out of the year. Wow. And that's when we kind of hashed the idea for fractional distilling. So we capture Seville oranges when they're at their peak and when we can get them. And then we have them throughout the rest of the year. So our gin tastes the same today as it will six months from now. So you have all these, your fractions, all your different distillates. Are mm -hmm. you, is it the same blend each time, the same amount of each one? Or are you kind of like tasting blending? Like I'm thinking about the little I know about winemaking. They're often sort of adjusting the grape varieties There's, a little bit here and there. Yeah, you know, with, with wine, wine is, and grapes are so uh, determinant on the vintage. With the botanicals that we use, it's not as impactful. Uh, so Seville oranges have a lot of, it's like almost a fixed commodity not a lot of variability in product. Uh, we use Brayburn apples from my backyard in Ballard. Oh. Um, there's a little variability there in terms of yield, but not quality. Mm -hmm. So that remains the same. Also, we planted Douglas fir trees, riffing off the idea of another distiller who distills Douglas fir and that in the kind of the reproductive cycle of a Douglas fir, it shoots out these little fronds every month as part of its reproductive cycle, but it doesn't taste like pine, it tastes like citrus. So we snip those and distill them right away. You can do that every month. But again, we're taking the ingredient at its peak and distilling it. Mm -hmm. And so for each of those seven ingredients, that's what we do. And, you know, it's worked out pretty well. We were, we were happy to get some nice uh, awards and stuff. And that kind of helps push the business side of, of things going along. So it was it was a smart move in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that that was it makes it seven times more difficult to make our gin. But we mm -hmm. feel it, it really makes a difference. Oh, yeah. No, that sounds amazing. So you have not just gin, you have other um, spirits as well. And I know that other ones have won awards and are special in their own ways. Now I understand yeah. why your gin is special. Can you tell me about one of your other favorites and what makes it unique? Sure. Well, our, our whiskey, uh, particularly our bourbon, um, we don't have a lot of it because it's all aging, but uh, we use, we don't use a commodity corn. We use actual corn from farmers that we know. So we have a great company we work with and introduces us to farmers who have rotated out other crops to plant corn for us. So we use organic non-GMO corn that we could mill our, our corn and make really good polenta out of it. Mm. Um, it's not that commodity 
kind of corn that has some corn and some animals and bugs right, and right. stuff like that. So it's it's actual culinary level corn. And it imparts uh, just a, it makes a big difference in the, the quality of our, our whiskey. And we pay a little bit more for it, but we feel it's worth it. And on that same token, uh, the barrels that we use, the cooperage was important to us, knowing that in whiskey, that's like 50 percent of your flavor is your your barrel. And in touring around looking for barrel cooperage sources, we went to Kentucky and saw the coopers there. And, you know, they're very, very busy old barrel factories. They make about 3,000 barrels a day at these places, but wow. quality is just not there. Particularly then how they fell the trees and assemble the barrels. It just didn't, it didn't seem right to get something so rickety for something so important to us mm-hmm. as being 50 percent of our flavor profile. So we went to the wine route and uh, being the wine nerd that I am, we got to meet a lot of different wine coopers. And one that we found was in Higby, Missouri, that made really beautiful 53 and 59 gallon barrels for wineries and specifically Silver Oak Winery in the Alexander Valley and Napa Valley. And they made oak barrels for their Alexander Valley wines. And we asked them, hey, could you, you know, toast some of your barrels for us to a char? And they said, sure, yeah, yeah, we could for you. And then we were like, great, we're real happy with the quality. And then we saw the bill. And these barrels cost significantly more than your typical uh, whiskey barrel. But, (laughs) you know, we, we went for it. And so now we source a unique barrel for our, our whiskey. And so that imparts another element of, I guess you could say, speciality that makes our whiskey different from someone else's. Is it weird for me to ask how much a barrel costs? Like how much would a normal barrel cost and how much would just like a, I have no idea, like it, uh, anywhere near what it could be. Well, a normal whiskey barrel would be between two and $300 mm-hmm. and ours cost uh, $650. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a significant difference. And a lot of it is just we we felt it was important to find someone who was responsible about farming the trees. And, you know, we have serial numbers from what tree was cut down and oh, they wow. cut that tree down into something called bolts and they turn those bolts into the staves and they can track every element of that barrel and it makes up for a, a barrel that has a very tight cellulose structure because mm-hmm. it's an organic matter. And the tighter the wood grain, the more interaction, the more time you're going to get with that whiskey interacting with the barrel and that interchange happens a touch slower, but you're getting much more impact and overall flavor. You you just have to be patient. So, okay. Now you've definitely convinced me that I need to try your (laughs) gin and your bourbon. You haven't tried it yet? No, I know. I know. I'm dreaming about it now. Like as we speak. (laughs) So you ship, do you ship all across the U.S.? I know you're you're based in Washington state, right? Yeah, we're in Seattle. We're a, a direct to consumer in the states that allow such commerce, but we have a new distribution partner and it will allow us to cast a larger net as we have, we have a new distribution. Uh, coincidentally, just four blocks from my house in Ballard in Seattle. And it allows us to produce enough that we can branch out our, our distribution chain. Oh, that's exciting. Congratulations. That's got to be really a nice step to be taking. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Well, I will put for anybody who is as intrigued as I am, I'll put the link to your site in the show notes for this episode and they can go to wildwoodspiritsco.com as well. But now we need to turn over to the second most important part of the show. Have you brought Mm -hmm. a surprise recipe of the day for me? I have. Oh, good. What is it? Okay. So just the ingredients you want me to go through? Oh, no. Tell tell me what the recipe is for, like the name of the recipe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, We call it the panacea. Panacea. So that means like cure. Is that right? Cure all. Yeah. Cure all. So it's a riff off our gin name, Cure. So it gives you the first clue as to what an ingredient might be in this drink. It's a cocktail. Yeah. Yes. It is a cup. Oh, awesome. Yep. I'm excited. Good, good, good. Okay. How do you make the panacea? Okay. So uh, it's one ounce of the world-renowned Cure Gin from Wildwood Spirits Company. And it has then three quarters of an ounce of Campari, three quarters of an ounce of Carpano Antica Sweet Vermouth. Remind me, a Negroni is also gin and Campari, right? And Sweet Vermouth. So and it vermouth. is a riff. Riff off a Negroni. Okay, wonderful. Very cool. I love Negronis. I was in yeah. Florence a few months ago, and I had a lot of Negronis. <laughs> they're, yeah, well, I love them too. They're just, they're, it's such a dynamic drink. Yeah, I, I love it. 
And so in addition to those, the triumvirate that make up a Negroni, then there's a quarter ounce uh, yellow chartreuse. Is that licorice Uh, It has some licorice elements. Um, It's this really ancient liqueur made by Chartreusean monks in France. And it has a a ton of different botanicals that really are, it's floral, it has a little bit of that anise component, Mm -hmm. but um, it's a really dynamic liqueur. And then there's a quarter ounce of Luxardo maraschino cherry liqueur, and then a quarter ounce lime juice. Oh, interesting. Oh, I like that. I really like cherry and lime together too. That's a really nice combination. So I, yeah, so it's almost like a hybrid between uh, a Pegu Club cocktail and a Negroni. And then the bridge is that yellow chartreuse and that's what pulls it together. So you've got like this real interesting kind of European based cocktail with that, you know, the old Raj cocktails from Southeast Asia that the, mm. the British would create, like that Pegu Club drink, which is a lime juice and base drink. So yeah. it's really, real interesting. And then um, you put it in a, a cocktail um, mixer and uh, mix it with ice for 30 seconds and then strain it into a cocktail coupe and a swath mm. of orange on top and whammo, panacea. Yes, I it's imagine cool. it does cure all. It sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Thanks. well, thank you so much. This is so exciting. I want to get my hands on the gin and try making this the <laughs> right way. So yes. um, I will definitely be doing that soon. Great. Eric, can you just remind everybody where they can find you? Are you guys doing any social media or should they just head to your website? Where's the best place if they want to learn more? Well, if they want to learn more, definitely come to our website, wildwoodspiritsco.com. But we're all over social media, Facebook, Instagram. We don't really X or Twitter so much. And we're available in in Washington, at least now, at Whole Foods, Total Wine, Met Market, and then a bunch of different different restaurants have been great supporters of us. Oh, that's fantastic. I know we have listeners out there, so they will be on the lookout for us and they'll see what they can find. Thank you so much, Eric. This has been fascinating. My pleasure. Thanks for chatting. that recipe divine i want that cure-all i'm telling you i like i said at the beginning of this show my energy is super high adrenaline rush from being on tv and yeah i think i'm gonna celebrate tonight with maybe something along those lines eric it was lovely talking with you thank you for being on the show and i will put links to wildwoodspiritsco.com in the show notes for everyone to go and check that out So, um, what is happening in my kitchen? Well, what has been happening is I was getting ready for the live segment. So I was making up some barbecue sauce to take with me so they could taste the finished product. That was definitely happening this week. And other than that, not much. And not much is going to be happening in my test kitchen because I'm actually going to be in Denver. When you listen to this at the beginning of May, I will be out there. I'm speaking at a food blogging conference about food podcasting, trying to encourage more of my food blogging friends to podcast and give more audio content for those of us who love audio content. So I'm talking about that over in Denver. And then Marty's semester of teaching is wrapping up. And so he is heading out there to meet up with me. And I think I told you about this already. Yeah. So we're going to go to some restaurants. We're going to do some hiking. And that is what I am doing when you're listening to this. And so there is nothing going on in my kitchen this week. As to what is going live on the websites, there are a couple of recipes, one on each website. There is a really wonderful salad going up on the cookful. It's a salad inspired by a drink, actually. You know how cucumber is often put in water and it's like super refreshing and sometimes there's like mint or lime, that kind of thing in there. I got to thinking one day, this needs to be a salad. And so it's a creamy cucumber salad that has mint and lime, fresh mint, fresh lime juice. It is so beautiful and lovely, refreshing, delicious. That is going up on the Cookful this week. And on Cook the Story, another salad. You know, we're early 
May, I'm getting ready for like Memorial Day, heading into that summer season. This is a creamy coleslaw recipe. This is the one, you know, it's the one my mom does that she told us about when she was on this show. It's got her special ingredients in it. There's pickle juice and horseradish in there. And it's like this really, I don't know, it's like savory, rich, a little garlicky, creamy, wonderful coleslaw. If you are a fan of creamy coleslaw, you are going to love this recipe. That one is going up on Cook the Story this week as well. As to what I'm telling you about on this show in the days ahead, well, that cucumber mint salad is going to be there as well. There's a nice salmon recipe, a very convenient way to cook corn on the cob. And oh, that Italian pasta salad, I told you about it last week. The one that's based on the Olive Garden tossed salad, that pasta salad is on my list for this week to tell you about as well. So lots of delicious food. Make sure you are subscribed to the show. Head to cookthestory.com slash R-O-T-D. You can subscribe there and see all the recipes or wherever you listen to podcasts, search for recipe of the day. I'm pretty much everywhere. And yeah, you'll be getting a new recipe every single day, seven days a week. From there, make sure you are a part of our Facebook group. I post the links to the recipe every day there, so you can always find that. That's at facebook.com slash groups slash recipe OTD. Don't forget to go and check out Eric at Wildwood Spirits. And watch my video clip, me live on TV making barbecue sauce and talking about cooking burnout. It is a lot of fun. The link is in the show notes. Oh, I'll put it in the Facebook group as well. It should definitely be there. So lots of places to find me. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Christine Pittman from cookthestory.com, thecookful.com, the all new chicken cookbook, and from this podcast, Recipe of the Day. I hope you have a great weekend. Let's get cooking.